Praise the Lord, church. Praise the Lord. Can we give him a hand, a strong hand clap of praise tonight? Praise God. Uh, I am very nervous. That's probably why I mess up on the music. I, I do apologize, guys. Um, but as I was thinking this week, I was thinking about a conversation that I had with a, uh, y'all can be seated. Um, a conversation that I had with one of my coworkers, and we were sitting in the office, and we were just typing. And he, uh, comes up to me, and or he's sitting there next to me, and he's he asked me a, a question, and he asked me why Pentecost. And I really thought about it, you know, and the only answer that I could really give him is because it's real. And he asked me, well, why is it real? And I said, because all the things that I have seen, that I have experienced, and uh, the things that God has done for me personally that I have seen in my own life and the, the life of my family, um, God has been really good to us. And so he, we start talking about that, and I tell him, well, you know, I've seen miracles happen and, and stuff. People get healed. The blind receive their eyesight. Uh, the deaf can hear. Um, and many stories that we all have witness to to miracles that God has performed and so he said well what's the difference between y'all and everybody else and I said because we're real I told him again because we're real he's like so you don't think the Baptists or the Catholics or another denominations uh, believe in miracles and I said I, or perform miracles and I said yeah I think so um, and I remembered back to the story of Moses when uh, God had gave him the, the staff to go to uh, to Pharaoh to free his people. And he threw his staff and it became a snake. And well, the others, the Egyptians also threw their staff and they were snakes. And uh, I was really thinking, I was like, well, what was the difference between both? And if we read on in the passage, uh, we know that the Moses snake ate the other snakes. And so I really thought about it, and I said, well, what leads back to why we're so real, or why this is real, why is Pentecost real? And I thought back to our foundation, which is our rock, which is Christ, that he didn't build the church on the sand, but he built it on a rock. And we have a rock that we can stand on, a foundation that is strong, and I'm grateful for that foundation. I just thought I'd share that with you, but if we can turn to the book of Jeremiah Chapter 18, I'm going to be short. This is, I was telling, talking to myself in the mirror there at the house, and uh, it was literally 15 and a half minutes, and uh, I'll be gone, I promise. Um, Jeremiah chapter 18, uh, verse 2. Praise God. And it says, Arise and go down meant he had to come up from a high place to go down to the potter's house and there I will cause you to hear the words then I went down to the potter's house and behold he wrought a work on the wheels and the vessel that he made of clay was marred or disfigured in the hand of the potter so he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it then the word of the Lord came to me saying O house of Israel, can I not do with you as this potter, saith the Lord? Behold, as the clay is in the potter's hand, so are ye in my hand, O house of Israel. Y'all can be seated. So this came to me actually several months before Brother Phillips had came, and I had just really been, I left it on the sort of like the back burner, didn't really mess with it. But I want to title the subject or this brief moment with y'all. A broken masterpiece. A broken masterpiece. A masterpiece is a work with extraordinary skill, specific, especially a supreme intellectual or artistic achievement. Outside in the world, we obviously see a lot of masterpieces. And when you really think of a masterpiece, the first thing... The Mona Lisa painting, painted by Leonardo da Vinci which is in the museum in Paris, it is said that this painting is the masterpiece of all paintings. Means this is probably the best painting out there 
over the rest of the paintings. Then we go to the Last Supper painting by also the same person, Leonardo da Vinci, where it paints a picture of Jesus eating with his 12 disciples. And then we have the creation of Adam by Michelangelo, which was painted in Rome depicting God creating Adam in the Old Testament and both God and Adam's touching hands. We can see that these masterpieces are paintings or other items that have been created that have an incredibly large value. For example, the Mona Lisa in December 14th, 1962 was valued at a million dollars, a hundred million dollars. In today's value, it's up to about nine hundred million dollars. The Last Supper painting is worth four hundred and fifty million dollars. But also in the title, there's also the word brokenness, a condition in which something is badly damaged, unable to continue or work correctly or a strong emotional pain that stops someone from living a healthy life. There are many instances where we can experience brokenness. We can see in the physical world where someone can be emotionally broken by losing a loved one, a heartbreak, rejections, feel that you're not worth, or emptiness. But I want to talk to you about two types of brokenness. The, the brokenness before Christ and the brokenness with Christ. What's the difference between the both? Were we still a masterpiece before Christ or were we one in the making? Before Christ, we were lost. We were the clay that still had not been formed yet. Not a physical formation, but a spiritual formation. Before Christ, we were lost in sin, lost in transgressions, not formed to what Christ had planned for us. If we go to verse 2, it says, Arise and go down to the potter's house, and there I will cause thee to hear my words. During the time of our text, the potter's house was usually outside the city walls. This was to allow the potter to not bother those in the city, for when he was making the clay, the smoke would come out, and it wouldn't be a fire hazard for the city. We see here where it says to go down, which meant he had to go from the top where the city was and go down to where the potter was. God will never allow us to grow at the top, because we have not been molded yet to what God wants us to do at the bottom. The process of formation of a masterpiece, Romans, uh, Isaiah 64 and 8, it says, But now, O Lord, thou art Father, we are the clay, and thou art potter, and we are all the work of thy hand. So the first process to making this masterpiece that God has for us is to go pick the clay. It has to go out and pick it up and I was really studying about it and I was looking at some things to where the potters would go out and pick it up from the ground in the wilderness in the jungles they would just pick pieces of of this dirt uh, to make clay uh, and then to form then the second part is to form something with clay you have to add water John Mark uh, 1 and 4 says, John did baptize in the wilderness and to preach the baptism of repentance, a remission of sins. we got to be baptized to make it. You can't make it unclean in heaven. you got to be washed, and that is when you get molded. Then you have the furnace. When you are already been picked and you're starting formation, you've been formed from what God wants you to be, then you have to do the trial of fire. Talk about Job. If we see him, he had lost his children, he has lost his wife, and even his friends uh, were, were wanting him to turn away from God. And a good example of a, of a uh, trial by fire could have been the preaching Wednesday night, where God is really directing us of what the say of the Lord and what he's wanting us, what he's wanting me out of uh, for his glory. This comes when we die to ourselves and Christ at this point we have now made the decision to have it God's way sometimes our formation will be alone away from everybody down in the potter's house like the process of clay in the hands of the potter being away from the city and you feel like you're not making it through your walk with God remember you're in the formation stage and on the way to be in the masterpiece that God wants you to be how do we now know God to how do we now allow God to form us but only by doing his will. Remember, church, we cannot do God's will on our terms. My thoughts, ideas, and self-will does not supersede the death of the cross. We cannot learn to our own understanding. We were created to worship him, 
to do his will, that no matter what we had to do or say or be, it still has to be God's way. Galatians 2 and 20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. In the life which I now have, live in the flesh, I live by faith for the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. If we go back to the verse, uh, to our scripture in verse 4 of the text, and it says, And the vessel that he made of clay was marred or deformed in the hand of the potter. So he made it again another vessel as seemed good to the potter to make it. The furnace back then usually was about 2,100 to about 2,200 degrees Fahrenheit, and the process of the burning was about 10 hours. Sometimes, due to ourselves, sometimes God will have to put us through the fire to get things out of our lives that will not bring him glory. But that's why we have to be filled with the Holy Ghost because it helps us to be able to keep us to do God's will. We see these paintings mentioned that are priceless, where they are worth so much and many people admire them for what they are. But remember that we don't have a price tag. No matter how much you think you're worth something or what you may think of yourself and your strengths, abilities, talents, or even gifts, we weren't our own creators. We were brought with a price, a price that was paid on Calvary. 1 Corinthians 6, 19. What? Know ye not that your body is a temple of the Holy Ghost which is in you, which ye have of God, and you are not your own? Self doesn't belong to self. Self belongs to Christ. For you are bought with a price. That was Calvary. Therefore, we have to glorify in our body, in this flesh, and in our spirit, which are God's. So remember, when you were lost in sin, lost in addiction, lost in misery, lost in the world, from the God, from the cross, God saw a broken masterpiece. You know how God saw you in your past mistakes and the unformed clay. Revelations 22 and 13, I am the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning, and the end, the first, and the last. So since he saw what, was, since he saw what the beginning was and also seeing what the ending is, he knows what you were in the beginning. He saw you in the unformed clay at the beginning of your formation. He looked at the end of the formation when he saw you as a masterpiece. A masterpiece of nothing, which over 2,000 years ago and now 222, you would be something. Remember, church, no matter how much value you think you're worth or how useless you think you are, just remember God valued you enough to go to the cross and die for your sins. You may see things as priceless in a physical perspective, but remember to God, you are a priceless masterpiece. My goodness, aren't you thankful? Why, why am I having to go through this trial and this test and this fire? Because God's trying to burn things out of your life that's not going to bring him glory. But when the, when the gold come out of the fire, the impurities was burned out of it, and it was pure. I don't know about you, but I want to be pure, undefiled before Jesus Christ. Amen. Hallelujah. What a God. Thank you, Brother Esau. We are priceless to him. Amen. We are priceless to him. Hallelujah. I'm going to take that word, brother. I'm going to take that word. Amen. Brother Fuller, you ready? Amen. I said, brother, you want to go first or last? Uh, and I said, before you answer it, Jesus said. I'll go first. I appreciate Brother Fuller and this man's walk with God. And uh, I love this family. And uh, they are a tremendous benefit here at this church. Amen. They are a tremendous benefit. Amen. Come and preach to us. Everybody say, Brother Fuller, you're at home. Preach to us. Amen. Thank you, God, for his grace and mercy. And we're all a growing process. We all got a long ways to go. All right. Start out in 2 Corinthians. Chapter 5, 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verses 18 and 19. And all things are of God, who hath reconciled us to himself 
by Jesus Christ, and hath given to us the ministry of reconciliation, to wit that God was in Christ, reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them, and hath committed unto us the word of reconciliation. All right, you may be seated. Tonight, my message is titled, Committed Jesus. Definition of commitment says, a state of personal dedication to something or someone which results in actively promoting and working for their good and well-being. I'd hear say tonight, especially here in America, that we all have a problem with commitment. <clears throat> now, commonly today, the order of things that God had planned is for us to grow up, to get a job, to get married, and have children. These three things take commitment. In the job place, you'll face adversity every day. Your body works against you. Your mind works against you. Outside forces work against you. You come against walls day in and day out. In marriage, when you get married, there's the honeymoon phase. And you two form and bond together. But after a while, that, honey that honeymoon phase ends. And that's when you begin to face problems and issues. Now, you could either choose to grow together and work on it and press past those things. Or you could drop that commitment. And then the children come along. And this is really where the rubber meets the road. Because if you thought that you lost a lot when you got married. commitment but the problem that we're facing today is there is no commitment they start out and they enter into a contract they sign a piece of paper for a job a marriage certificate a birth certificate making commitment but then when the the tough times come when there's adversity people tend to walk away now it's easier to be responsible for yourself than for others so that's what people look at, and they choose to walk away from being selfless back into themselves, to only take care of themselves, to only pleasure themselves. They become self-centered. They get tired because when you have to be selfless, then you're constantly bucking against your nature. You're constantly fighting because it's not about getting your way anymore. It's about providing for someone else. It's about looking outside of yourself. And giving up yourself to create and mold another person, another situation. It takes commitment. Even when you don't feel like it. Now, quitting can be the easiest way out. But it's an addiction. Some time ago, there was a book written about a true story in Africa. It was called The Ghost in the Darkness. And what happened was there was a little village in Africa... And these lions, this lion came in, and he killed a human. Now, when a lion tastes the blood of a human, it becomes, in, it, it just becomes all-encompassed. And all it wants to eat is human flesh. It no longer desires the gazelles, the zebras. It just wants the human flesh. So this lion comes in, and it's constantly picking people off at night. It's taking them away and killing them. So these African villages, they hire someone outside of the country to come in and to hunt these lions. Quitting is a lot like those lions. You think about it at first, and it comes on your mind. Just like that lion, at first, around humans, it's very timid. And it walks around and paces, and it sees the danger. But then one day it commits itself, and it goes in. And once it tastes that flesh, it wants nothing more and it becomes easier to defy the dangers of humanity. With quitting, it's the same thing. It comes in your mind. And once you give into it just one time, it becomes an addiction. It gets easier and easier to walk away from your commitments. So now, when we lose heart, we lose heart when we don't see these prayers. When there's unanswered prayers, 
when we read the Bible and we see all these promises, but we don't see them manifested in our lives. Those commitments that we've made to God, that we've made to our church, they begin to become really difficult because we're looking and we're not seeing the results. So it's easy to just throw in the towel and to walk away. But I'll tell you this, there is a difference between walking with Jesus and being committed to Jesus. See, there was thousands that walked with Jesus and saw him perform miracles. There were thousands of people that were touched by him when they were fed by loaves of bread and fish that, were, that had wine at the, at the wedding. Those that were in the crowds the day when there was healings taking place. There were thousands of people that saw Jesus and knew who he was and walked with him. But how many of those men were with Jesus when he died on that cross? See, the thing is, there were two men that walked with Jesus. And they're contrasted very differently. There was Peter and Judas. They both walked with Jesus. They both had a commitment, but they both threw in that commitment and they walked away. But look at it from their perspective. Look at it from everyone's perspective, the 12 apostles. Here's this man, Jesus, who claims that he's the Savior, that claims that he's going to come and do away with sin. He's going to do away with the Roman nation. He's going to bring all people together. He is their Savior, their Creator. He is the I Am. He says all these things. They see the miracles. They see it. They know it. They feel it with all of their hearts. And then they see Jesus upon that cross. Everything that they believed is done. There's nothing left. All hope is gone. He's in the final place. Was it really God? Was he really who he said he was? See, when Judas, he gave up everything, his commitment, and he betrayed Jesus. Peter gave up his commitment to Jesus and walked away. He denied Jesus three times. The difference is Judas let that guilt eat him alive, just like that lion and that taste of blood. That guilt will destroy you. Jesus never, or Judas never repented. He hung himself. But Peter held on. And that's what we have to do is we have to hold on. Because even if we don't see the promises manifested, even if we don't see those prayers answered, we still have to press on because even though Jesus is upon the cross and he's dead and all of our hopes are gone and in that grave, if you just hold on, you'll see the end. Jesus came back out of that grave. Peter saw him. Jesus spoke to him personally. Ever since then, his faith was restored. He recommitted his life to Jesus. He went out into Nero's world and the Romans where they faced adversity, where they were taking Christians and using them as torches, live torches. And he preached the gospel. He preached on the day of Pentecost. He gave his own life on the day that he died and was crucified. He has to be crucified upside down because he wasn't worthy to be crucified the same way Jesus was. This is Peter, the same man that walked away from Jesus. The same man that denied him three times. He gave up his commitments on that day. But when Jesus came back and he held on, he recommitted his life. Now, are we willing to walk with Christ? Are we willing to, get, to commit ourselves to Christ? Just remember, if you failed Jesus, he died on that cross for you. That doesn't have to be the end of your story. You could choose on that day when you break your commitment and you fail, which we all will and we all do. You could choose Judith's past his path to let that eat him alive, to give up, to throw in the towel. Or you could choose Peter's path to keep on, even though it's hard to believe, even though you can't see it, even though it seems like all hope is gone and there's nothing left, even when it hurts so bad, you can't see past the pain. 
Because that'll be the time when Jesus comes out of the grave and he sits down and talks to you personally when you've let go and given up. If everybody could please stand. We all obeyed the gospel. We repented from our sins. We were baptized with Jesus Christ in the water. We were buried with him. We received the gift of the Holy Ghost, and we spoke in tongues. On that day, we made a commitment to Jesus. We've walked day after day in that commitment. And we failed sometimes, but we have to keep going. And it's hard to get that commitment to Jesus. Because committed to Jesus, it means arising. We, we build our commitment when we have faith in his promises and the knowledge of his saving power and divinity. It's the expressed work, it's expressed in our worship, and it ultimately leads to our obedience to Jesus. So even if you failed, you could still pick yourself up. You still have a chance. You still have an opportunity to come back to God, to be the Peter, to Jesus. So I'm asking tonight, if anybody here is lacking in that commitment, if anybody here needs to renew that commitment and rededicate yourself, that you come tonight before these altars. It's a hard thing sometimes to admit when we've gone off track. And sometimes we don't even realize it ourselves. So, for the rest of the, the, the service tonight, I just would ask that you would come and you would uh, give everything you have to God and recommit yourself tonight.
pray against the spirit of quitting right now. I pray against the spirit of heaviness and weariness, God. I command and I pray a refreshing over every life, over every heart, God, of every person in this facility and those that are watching online, God. Let us have a fresh commitment tonight. Amen. Let us not go back to what we are comfortable with. Let us go. Let us not go back to where you have brought us out of. But let us be willing to follow you past the cross. Let us be willing to follow you past the altar. Let us be willing to follow you past repentance, God, and restoration that you can use our life for your benefit. In Jesus' name, in Jesus' name, in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Sometimes the easiest thing to do is just quit and throw in the, the towel. But can I tell you that's very rarely ever the right choice. Amen. And the first time you quit, like Brother Gabriel said, the second time becomes easier, the third time becomes easier, and the fourth time is just a breeze. That's why there's a danger, a danger of backsliding. Coming in, getting established, and then quitting. Coming in, getting established, and then quitting. If you're not careful, that will plague you throughout your whole life. Let me tell you, come in, commit to God through the tough, through the hard, and there's going to be more good than there is bad. Amen. There's going to be more roses, amen, than there are funerals. That's what I'm believing him for. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you so much, Brother Esau and Brother Gabriel, amen, for that word. Amen. That's interesting about the lion, huh? Once he tastes of human blood, he never wants the gazelle or... I'm never going to a zoo again. Amen. I'm just picking. Thank you for that word tonight. Thank you so much, Brother Esau and Brother Gabriel. Amen. Aren't you glad you came to church today? Let's stand one more time and give him a good hand clap of praise for the word that God has given to us. God, we want you to know we're thankful. We're thankful for what you did today. We're thankful for the words that you're giving us today. And we're going to leave with joy and thankfulness. And we're going to come back Wednesday with praise and thanksgiving, God, desiring to receive something else. Amen. Hallelujah. Thank you for coming. Amen. Let's remember all of the things we have going on midweek. Ladies Bible study. And then this coming weekend is going to be our Christmas banquet service at 10 o'clock. We're going to have a lot of good Christmas singing. So let me tell you, this, this Sunday at 10 o'clock, we're going to have several different people singing Christmas songs, and it's going to be like a mini Christian Christmas concert. I had to throw Christian in there. Amen. Because we ain't going to be singing Jingle Bells, all right? Or we might be singing Jingle Bells. I don't know. But, but, amen, we're going to meet here at 10 o'clock, have a time of singing and worship. And there's going to be no preaching, but I still may give a word. If God gives me a word, I may say a few things, but I promise I won't preach an hour. Amen. And then that night's going to be our Christmas banquet at 6 o'clock. Thank you to everyone who has signed up to come to our Christmas banquet. We're going to have a great time. And I'm just thankful the, for the blessings of God that he's given all of us this past year. And the greatest thing about Christmas is Jesus Christ. Amen. And so we want to recognize and honor him and his birth through this season. Hallelujah. You're dismissed in Jesus' name. Be sure and greet Brother Fuller and Brother Esau and tell them what a great job they did. God bless you. You're dismissed.